Genesis 18, 16. You remember last week we were looking at Abraham sitting at the opening of his tent when the strangers approached him. The two angels and the Lord. We watched as they had fellowship together around the meal. It was, it's a wonderful time there. The Lord made re-emphasized his promise about a son. And now that fellowship time is over around the table and we're going to make a little walk now. So we pick up and be reading in verse 16 and following here. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went, there, went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. This is actually, I guess if you were in a literature class, you would say this is the Lord's soliloquy. He makes a pretty long little speech here, and it's a slip up, a, about judgment, and it's a judgment on those cities of the plain, and the major city there, of course, is Sodom. It's interesting that God has a double motivation for revealing his plan to Abraham. First, he says, Abraham is going to be blessed. He's going to be a blessing to the world. And so therefore, God told him that this one city, I'm talking about Sodom, but all those cities, they're going to be removed before they have a chance to be blessed from that which is going to come from him. And secondly, Abraham was to teach his offspring righteousness and justice. That is, what is right and just so that they could enjoy the mighty blessings that God is going to bring. He said, for I know that he will command his children and his household after him. And they will keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. Abraham now is being required to do something that is supposed to be done generation after generation after generation. Fathers are supposed to teach their children. When fathers don't teach their children, what happens? They don't learn. They don't learn the things of the Lord. The Father's going to teach them something. What God's talking about here, of course, is His Word. Teach them what God says. He says, I know Abraham's going to do that. Genesis, he says, I know him, and he will command his children. And as long as the fathers continue to teach their children, things went pretty well. But when fathers quit, and today they have quit. For the most part, fathers today do not teach their children. Children do not know about the Lord. I'll tell you what, those children might be able to tell you about football or basketball or whatever the interest of their father is, but they don't teach them about God. Fathers are not taking their children to Sunday school and church. In many cases, when they do, they drive them to the door, push them out, and come back an hour later and get them. Fathers need to be like this and teach their children. You know, people say, well, this is Abraham. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about fathers that believe in God. He's talking about every father to do these things. And since the outcry of the people against the, the grievous sins of Sodom and Gomorrah was so great, this city was so wicked, so evil, that the Lord... So to speak, it's kind of a figure of speech. The Lord went down to see if it was all together true. The Lord knows. He knows all about the situation. And his, he's all knowing. 
He knew the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. But what he's doing here by saying, I'm going to go down and look, he is demonstrating his justice to those people. He's, and for Abraham, he's telling Abraham, I am a just and righteous God. I'm not judging from what I heard, even though he knows, like we do. We hear something and we judge, don't we? If the media says something loud enough and often enough, people get to believe it. God says, I'm going to go down and see for myself and judge righteously. That's the picture we get here. And if the sin of those people was complete, then God is going to judge them. And so we pick up here in verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. You notice the two angels are walking down the road. And it seems right here that Abraham just kind of stands in the presence of the Lord, pre-incarnate Christ here. So how do you know it's pre-incarnate Christ? Well, God the Father is spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. Only the second person of the Trinity ever appears in human form, and that's Jesus Christ. We have a theophany here, a pre-incarnate Christ. Now, I can't prove this biblically, but I have a feeling that if you would look in the face of Jesus as Abraham did that day, and then you would look in the face of Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee, it might be the same face. It's the same God. That's just me. I can't prove that biblically, but I just see the same Lord there. And Abraham is standing before him. And Abraham drew near. Think that's, you know, you could preach a sermon on that, couldn't you? He's not only standing before the Lord, he drew near him. Isn't that wonderful? Where are we supposed to be? Near him. There's a, something special here. You know, he, he's being drawn to the Lord. He wants to be as close to him as possible. Isn't that the way we should be? So Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? What a question. This is a rhetorical question Abraham asked the Lord. Will you judge the righteous with the wicked? God never judges the righteous. He might chastise them. He might take them to the woodshed, but he does not judge them. This is a wonderful question. It's also the reason we know that no part of the church will go through the tribulation. God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. You know, so God does not even have to answer here. It's a question, but he's making it basically as a statement. Peradventure, there are 50 righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that therein? in? That be far from thee to do after this man, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should be as the wicked. Be, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Here again, you know, he keeps back to the same point. You're not going to slay the righteous with the wicked. That's far from you. Will not the judge of the, of the whole earth do what's right? Yes. You see, Abraham understands something that so many people today don't understand. God judges righteously. He doesn't judge the righteous. He will judge the wicked. You know, what we have here is the first prayer of intercession in Scripture. Abraham's praying. He's not on his knees. He doesn't bow his head, but he's praying. He is talking to the Lord. And the Lord said, If I find 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Now, you know, a lot of people would say, Thank you, Lord, for answering that prayer. You'll spare it by 50 people. You know, Abraham knows something about Saul. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Notice he's humble now. Lord, I, I, I'm speaking to you. I'm nothing. I, I'm your creature. I knew that I was formed from the dust of the earth and you blew into my nostrils a breath of light. I know that. But can I continue to speak? For adventure, there shall lie five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy all the city for the lack of five? And he said, 
If I find 40 and 5, I will not destroy it. God continually answers the prayer here. Oh boy, the Lord, I've got 45. Hallelujah. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure thou shalt be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for 40's sake. What a long suffering God. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet. But this once, peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way. And as soon as he left communicating with Abraham, and Abraham returned into his place. What a prayer. You talk about a prayer warrior who wouldn't quit. 50, how about 45, 30, 20? How about 10? You won't destroy it for 10. Abraham thinks he can find 10 righteous people. In a city the size of Sodom. Ten. When well, he knew he had Lot and his wife and Lot's daughters and their husbands, and he thought, maybe I've got enough. Hmm. Here's the quote with I'll destroy the righteous with the wicked. No, he won't. And God proves that. I'll spare the sick. I'll spare all of them. We find ten. You know, makes me think about Jonah. Remember Jonah? He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He hated Nineveh. He hated those people. He didn't want to see them saved. And yet, when he went over, what did he preach? A, a, a message from the Lord of salvation? It was judgment. That was the message. You change your ways, judgment's coming. And they repented in sackcloth and ashes. God spared that city because they repented. The same thing here. He's going to spare that city if he can find us ten righteous people. Hmm. God's never going to sweep away the righteous with the unrighteous. Never has, never will. Does he have the right to, to send us out? Yes, he does. He has the right because we're all guilty. We're all lawbreakers. Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. And Abraham was convinced that there were some righteous people in Sodom. Uh, and he didn't pray for it, merely Lot. You know, that prayer was not selfish. Oh, Lord, will you spare it for my nephew Lot? You know, he never said that, did he? He's praying for the whole city with 50, 45, 30, 20, 10. You know, that's bold. You know, it is bold when you, you think about praying and you're standing in the presence of the Lord doing this. And the Lord is so gracious. He just... He listens, how patiently he listens. You know why he listens so patiently? Because Abraham's prayer was from right here. God knew he loved those people. God knew that his, his prayer was for those people. It wasn't a selfish prayer. If he would have said, well, will you just get light out? Uh, that would have been different. But you see, his heart is right. And his character is revealed in this great prayer of intercession. Is Abraham weak in time? Yes. But his faith is strong right here. He prayed that all the cities, the wicked, and in all those cities, the wicked, as well as the righteous, will be spared. You know, earlier, remember, he went and he rescued those people from Sodom. Physically rescued them. They've been taken captive. They were going to be being slaves. He went and rescued them. Now he's pleading for them with the same boldness with which he went out to fight for them. He wants this time though to save them spiritually rather than physically. He wants them to see the hand of God working. He wants to see these people actually turn to God. He pleaded for them just as he had fought for them. Abraham's bargaining here with God kind of shocks some people. 
How can he be like that? Don't we do that too? Haven't you ever bargained with God? Have you ever just kept talking and, and talking? And yeah, we do. Whether our hearts are strong as his was, I can't say. But Abraham's prayer, some people think it's a little audacious. You know, he was, but he was humble. And it was in profound reverence that he spoke this. He truly cared for the people. He loves the Lord. He did not want to say anything against the Lord. He did not want to be a bad witness as he prayed. He wanted to show the Lord respect. And he did. And he making his points that he wanted. And it was for justice that he pleaded for deliverance. 50, 45, 30, 20, and finally 10. You know, he's not trying to talk God into something that's against his will. Don't you remember that? He's not doing that. Later, Lot's prayer for Zohar is going to be quite the contrary. But here, he's praying that it would be God's will that he would spare the city from the righteous. He's not asking God to do anything out of his own character. And sometimes we, we think that we can kind of twist God's arm or we can go to God like Santa Claus. Well, Lord, I want this, 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 and this. It doesn't work. We need to, with us, as did Abraham, humbly, with the right heart, asking God with reverence and devotion to answer according to his perfect will. So this, uh, the theme of justice right here predominates this section. Those who are going to enjoy God's blessing. Those who will turn to Him, they're going to enjoy that blessing. You know, teaches justice. You know, we can intercede for justice. And God knows, you know, God, know that God may preserve the wicked for the sake of the righteous. You know, this section should really encourage Israel later on to know that God is a righteous judge. The righteousness, His righteousness, the righteousness of the people will exalt a nation. Proverbs 14.34 Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteous people help preserve society. That's what we're missing in our country today. The righteous people aren't standing up for what we need to be standing up for. Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. We lose our salt. What are we good for? So these truths should have been a great concern to Israel when they look at the story of Abraham here. And they needed to trust him and they needed to understand that they could go to him with prayers of intercession. After all, on the Day of Atonement, what did the high priest do? He was making atonement. He was making intercession for the people of Israel. What does Jesus Christ do for us today? He makes intercession as our high priest for us today. So we get into chapter 19 now. We see the judgment on the cities of the plains. This chapter records God's judgment on the, I don't know how else to put it, a morally bankrupt Canaanite civilization. But it also provides a pretty serious warning against others becoming just like them. But you know, we don't learn from our mistakes. You know, it was difficult to get Lot out of Sodom. And it was even more difficult to get Sodom out of Lot's family. We're going to see that. They become similar to it. Lot was an upright citizen. He was hospitable. He was generous. He was a leader of the community. You know, he, but he had assimilated into that city. He'd become part of them. He felt at home there. And when a righteous person, this is for us, when the church begins to be assimilated with the world, we have problems. We're not of the world. 
Lot wasn't of Sodom, but he got involved with them. Actually, he was a judge, he tells us. Lot set at the gate of Sodom. Judges usually set at the city gates and uh, public places where legal business was transacted and finalized. So Lot had moved his way up a little bit down in Sodom. As a judge, Lot had a job to kind of screen out wickedness of the townspeople and to give it life some good living. All I can say is good luck doing that in Sodom. You'd have to be an extremely strong individual to be able to stand there and tell them what is right and wrong and how to live a good life. And evidently he wasn't winning the battle. We see that. Lot knew justice. He knew truth. He knew righteousness. He knew evil. Second Peter tells us he was a righteous man. Second Peter 2, 7 and 8 says, speaking of the deliverance there, delivered just Lot, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. But he didn't leave. Did you notice that? I, that's my point. That's not the Bible. He didn't leave. It vexed his soul, the Bible says. He was a righteous man, but he stayed there. It's just like so many Christians today. They know what's right. They know what's wrong. They stay out there in the world. They're vexed by the wickedness, but they stay right there. But in spite of his lifestyle there, he, uh, he liked the good life he had in Sodom. He looks around, he sees the depravity, he sees the wickedness, but he likes his life there. He preferred making money off of its citizens to staying in the hills where he would, where there'd be no filthy living, but also no good life. He made a choice, it seems, more for his pocketbook than his heart. Because he's going to tell us, you know, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plains of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from another. What had drawn him there were the, the fields, the, the place for his flocks, well watered, grazing area. He put that behind him. He got involved with the city. But see, now the time has come, the hour of truth. There's a visitation coming, and it's coming from on high. This isn't your normal visitors who are coming. You know, Lot seemed to be godly and pure, but you know what? Lot's a hypocrite right now. He is. His words, we're going to find out in verse 14, are not taken seriously. This man first pitched his tent near Sodom, but later Sodom controlled his life. He was moral, for he opposed Sodom in homosexuality. He knew the great evil that he when he saw it. But ironically, he was willing to sacrifice his daughter's virginity to fend off the vice of the Sodomite men. Which sin's worse? I mean, he's, he's just so perplexed now with what's going on. He escapes the wrath of God, the judgment of God, but his heart was in Sodom. He was attached to the world. He was attached to them. His wife was too attached to the city to follow the call of grace. His daughters would, a little later, have no qualms with having sex with their father. As long as the Lord let Lot alone, he would seek to profess faith. While at the same time, he lived in Sodom. And he lived like Sodom. Ultimately, he would have both. Sodom would have destroyed him. He couldn't have both of them. So Sodom would have destroyed him, or the Lord would have destroyed Sodom. One or the other. Destroyed him with Sodom. He couldn't do both. Chapter 19. That, that's just warming you up in chapter 19. 
And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray thee, into thy servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned him unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did break un bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters, which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore they came under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal with worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they spoke the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, and whosoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But it seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. The first thing I want to tell you is that the great sin of Sodom was not in hospitality. They did not. Oh, they weren't hospitable. That's not the sin of Sodom. You know there are people who teach that? The sin is homosexuality. That's the sin of Sodom. That's where you get the word sodomy from. That's the sin here. So these two angels are actually very reluctant visitors to Lot. Lot asked them to come to their house, his house, and stay, and leave early in the morning. They had no intention of doing that. So we'll just stay in the street all night. In other words, the Lord sent us here to check things out. And I want to show you that we're doing just that. We're going to see what's going on. We don't need that, but we're going to see. This is to show that God cares. He's giving them every opportunity. But Lot keeps on. He keeps to come, come to the house, come to the house. Then wash your feet, fix his own food. While they're in the house with the unleavened bread. You see, unleavened bread also, you know, I just picked that up when I was reading here. Haste. There's haste here. You see, maybe Lot's wife didn't realize it. Maybe Lot didn't realize it with the unleavened bread. Didn't have time for that bread to rise. We got to get out of Dodge. Something's happening here. Isn't it amazing? All the times I've read, it's the first time it really hit me that there's something that has to happen quick. Just like getting out of Egypt. Don't have time to let that bread rise. They had unleavened bread. Of course, unleavened represents sin, so it's sinless. And so the angels went to Lot's house. It didn't take long for the men of the city. Notice it said, from every quarter, the great, the small, they're all coming. They want to send them out that we may know them. You know in King James English, that means they want to have sexual relations with these men. That's exactly what it means. They want to have sex with these men. 
They want Lot's minister to come out. These men must have been very handsome. These angels appeared, and I guess very attractive men. I don't know. But the vileness of these men is matchless. It is so bad. And surprisingly, Lot's hypocrisy is, is pretty much too, isn't it? It's vile. Listen, you fellas, uh, stay out here and I'll go get my dollars. I'll let you have them do whatever you want. Do you think that they would be satisfied with that? These men, there's no other but they're perverts. They want perversion. Oh, they would have taken his dollars and then they were going to break the door down. They wanted us men. You can't, you, know, you can't compromise with wickedness. You can't try to just maneuver it around. You cannot compromise. Lot should have just said absolutely no and stood his, stood his ground. To protect, one, to protect a guest was part of hospitality in those days, but that's going a little bit too far. The best thing Lot could have done, kept the door locked, and the thing he didn't do. What did he do? He never prayed. Not one time did he say, Lord, help me. Lord, what should I do? Not one single time. You know, if I had a bunch of men banging on my door, the first thing I think about was, Lord, can you help me? He never mentions that. That's how far he has come from where he started. So, the angels take charge of the situation. They pull him back in the house and they blind those men. Well, they're already spiritually blind. They might as well be physically blind to go with it. And with blind, they couldn't find the door. They wouldn't be able to find the lot when they gets ready to go out. Do you have any sons-in-law, daughters? Go get them. The Lord sent us here to destroy the city. And that's what we're going to do. We have to leave quickly. So he goes to his sons-in-law, and they mock him. God's not here. I can almost hear. God's going to destroy this city. Ah, yeah. Old man, get out of here. That's basically what's happening. They don't believe him. They're so far. They are Sodomites. They live in this city. They could have, you know, they could very easily have, have us been doing something else. They'd been banging on that door to them. So they mocked him. They won't go. He might as well have been mocked by everybody. He goes back. You know, it's an amazing thing. Nobody believes the Word of God. Dan and I were watching a movie last night, Jeremiah. No more movie. Nobody wanted to believe him. Of course, that's the way the Word of God is. Nobody wants to believe it. I think I can make it. I'm going to do this one, one last section before the time's up. Beginning in verse 15. And when the morning arose... Then the angels hasted Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and led him out, led him upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth, and set him without the city. I want to stop there just a second. What do you see in that verse? He lingered. Hmm? He lingered. You see anything else? They had to drag him out. Don't you see the rapture in that verse? Yeah. There, the rapture is right there. People, they're, these are righteous people, but yet they want to hold on to the world. The angel said, come on. The Lord shall send it Sin of heaven with a shout. The dead shall rise first and then we have to pull you out of this world. What a picture there. He's pulling them out. Pulling them out of the, the wrath and destruction that's coming. Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? No. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed me unto 
unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee into. It is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not the little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow the city, for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither. And I cannot do anything till thou comest thither. Therefore, the name of the city is called Zohar. So early the next morning, the angels have to drag them out. What does that tell you? They are really connected to this city. That the angels have to take them by the hand, Lot by the hand, his daughters by the hand, his wife, and literally drag them to the streets to get them out. The Lord, of course, is being merciful in sparing Lot for Abraham's sake. Even after he was delivered, Lot wrung a concession out of the angels. Well, he wanted to go to Zoar, a little small town. Zoar means little one. Before that, it was known as Bela, B-E-L-A. But this uh, scene would always remind Israel of Lot, lingering and halting, being dragged to safety. So why do, why do some of God's people fall in with the corrupt world rather than, you know, willingly flee a wicked society that's destined to destruction? I'm not going to give you that answer until next week because I'm out of time. It's like one of the old Saturday cereals when you were growing up. You have to come back next week. So we'll pick up in verse 23. You want to cut that off for me? All right. 